Hi folks, so I, um, I wanted to give everybody a quick video to help understand how to do this hand simulation that we see in homework B1. I've done a couple of examples in class, but I wanted to do one that was a little more hands-on that, uh, that might be uh, more amenable to, to sort of understanding the steps that you'll have to go through on your homework if you haven't followed so far in the lectures. So um, I've just opened up uh, Microsoft Word here. So I'm going to actually do the whole problem inside Word um, so you can kind of see the process there. And hopefully for those of you who are a little rusty on putting together uh, you know, technical documents inside Word, then maybe this will give you a couple little tips and hints there. So, um, so um, I am just going to create a column of random values for my inter-arrival times and my service times. These are, of course, already given to you in... Uh, the, the the homework assignment. So this isn't something you do, but I'm just going to create some random numbers here so that um, I can do a unique demo for you so that you still have the opportunity to try something fresh with your homework. So um, I'm going to put inter arrival times here. I'll just do uh, 2, 3, 10, and 7. Um, so I could do more, but I'm hoping I only need those four. And then, uh, so I you know, could do more here. So in a real simulation case, these would, in theory, go on forever because they'd be drawn from a random distribution. But I'll just do those. And then I'll do service times. Um, and I'll do um, 1, 13, 4, 2, 5. So again, I think I get five uh, service times in the homework. So I'll get five service times here. Again, they're sort of randomly generated. I didn't put these together. Um, so, because I, I didn't want, I know there's been a lot of confusion as to whether like an inter-arrival time was somehow associated with a service time. Well, really, they're just two lists, and um, and I just need to grab from the front of the list. So when I need my first inter-arrival time, I'll grab two. When I need my second inter-arrival time, I'll grab three. When I need my first service time, I'll grab one. Um, so I'm sort of got these separate. They're just two different processes. One process is generating inter arrival times. The other process is generating service times. Okay, so now um, we need to sort of keep track of uh, the state variables and so on and so forth. So we're eventually going to populate a table here. So I'm just going to insert table. And if I think about it, I've got, you know, how many columns do I need in this table? I've got my clock, my LS, my LQ, um, the checkout line, the future event list, um, ND, S, and F. So that sounds like eight columns. And I don't know how many rows I'm going to need, so I'm just going to arbitrarily go down and make it an 8x8. Eight eight. And if I need to add more rows, I'll add them. So there's my table. So I'm just going to say, all right, well, I know this first one's the clock, and then I think I do LS first, then LQ, then checkout line, uh, future event list, um, ND, S, and F. And um, so this will be where I'm going to end up putting everything. And so... I know I'm going to need a little more room for the future event list, so I'll just resize some of these columns uh, to give myself a little more room there, and also for the checkout line. So let's do both of those things right now, and we can actually do all of our work in the table. And I don't need as much room for LS and LQ. I actually don't remember which one goes first in your homework. It looks like LQ. I have a little sample of what we asked for, so I do LQ and LS. Okay. All right, now this first row, I know, uh, well, let's do something a little different. Let's think about our initial conditions. These are not things you'd have to report in your homework. These are just things to help you get started. And so we can say before the simulation, where um, did everything start? And we can say, well, um, before the simulation, how many people are in the queue? Well, we're going to say nobody's in the queue, nobody's in the server, the checkout line is empty, um, and now the future event list. So if I say that my end time, so let's just say my end time for this one, I'm going to do 20. So 
um, I know that initially my future event list is going to have at least that end event in it. So that's going to have end 20 in it. But I also know that conventionally my first event, the first thing that I process in the table is going to be the arrival of customer one. So that's what we have here. An event record, arrival zero, customer one is first, and then this end event, 20. And, um, and then I can say that my ND, we've had no departures, our response time accumulation is zero, and our number of departures greater than five in response time um, is also zero. So, um, but the kind of the most important thing here is this initial future event list. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I look at my initial future event list, and I see that it is um, at starting at time zero, or that's when the event happens. So that tells me that if I look up at this future event list, that tells me everything about the first row of this table. So I'm going to put a zero in there because that is a zero. And I'm processing an arrival. Um, so um, I am going to copy the rest of the future event list, this E20, whatever's left over. So I removed that first one, and I'm going to put it in the future event list for that row. I might need to add more to it, but I'm going to at least start because I know that the future event list of every row inherits um, all of the unused events from previous rows. So we started out initially with this future event list. We're processing this event, so it gets removed, but we're left over with these other events. And so that's what we put in this future event list. All right, so I just, I'm processing an arrival here. So someone has just arrived. So I have to think about um, what are the things that I need to do? Well, I know that whenever I process an arrival, I have, I'm effectively starting the activity of waiting for the next arrival. So I am going to then put into the future event list the next arrival, so the arrival of customer two. And so if I look at my inter-arrival times, I see that the next inter-arrival time, the time between customer one and customer two, is two seconds. So I'm going to look at my, I'm going to put into my future event list, so I go there, A, and then I say the inter-arrival's two, so I'm going to add two to whatever... Uh, my clock is right now. My clock is zero, so it's also two, and so customer two. So I know customer two is going to arrive at time two. Now I am just, for my convenience, going to delete that. I've used it, so I'm just getting rid of it. So I just deleted that inter-arrival time from my list, just to help me keep track of where I am. Now this arrival arrived, and the checkout line was empty, because the initial checkout line was empty. And so, because the initial checkout line is empty, this arrival can go directly into the server. So that tells me that my server, which I used to have no one in the server, now I've got one person in the server. And, that, and so I'm going to add customer1 to the checkout line. And that is the only entry in the checkout line, so that means that it's getting serviced right now. Nobody else is in the checkout line, so my LQ is going to stay equal to zero. Zero plus one is one. That's how many people in the checkout line. Now this record here, this number, this is the arrival time for customer one. It arrived at zero, so that zero is going to stay with customer one so long as customer one is in the checkout line. So I never change that right here. That attribute is fixed for all of customer one's lifetime. Now because customer one entered the server, it's now starting the act of being serviced. And so that is an activity. Whenever you start an activity, you have to schedule the end of that activity and that activity will be a departure. So I look at my service times, and I see that my next service time in my list is one. So I am going to schedule a departure one minute after the current time. So the current time is zero, so I'm going to schedule a departure for one. So I go into my future event list, and I put D1C1. And that means that I'm going to have a departure at time one. I always want to make sure my future event list is ordered by the time of the event record. That's why it goes 1, 2, 20. All right, now because this was an arrival, none of these things change. These cumulative variables for this simulation only change during departures. So I'm just going to 
leave them at whatever values they were. So that means I give them a zero, a zero, and a zero. All right, now I can forget about my initial conditions. So I'm just gonna delete those to get them out of the way. Oh, and I also am gonna delete this service time because I've already used that service time. And I also can delete this end time because I've already used it. So now I'm left with this table right here and I basically proceed using this as my guiding um, uh, future event list the same way I had an initial future event list that helped me generate this first row. So if I look at this future event list, I know my next event will be the first in this event record. So it's gonna be a departure and it's gonna happen at time one. So I'm gonna put a one down here. Now I copy everything else in that list down to start with, and then I process the departure. It was a departure of a customer, so no one is added to the queue, but the number of people in the server goes down by one because someone has just left the server. The checkout line, what I normally would copy down, I remove customer one from it, so now there's nobody in the checkout line. I have had a departure, so this goes up. Now I have to calculate the response time for customer one. Well, I'm at clock equal to one. I look at customer one from the previous checkout line, and I see that customer one arrived at time zero. One minus zero is one. So customer one was in the system for a total of one minute. So I'm gonna add one minute to S, and S used to be zero, so it just goes up to one. The response time for customer one is less than five minutes, and so I do not add one to F. All right. So I processed the departure and no one is left in the checkout line. I am currently still waiting during the uh, activity of waiting for customer two. That was already scheduled. So there's no other activities to schedule. There's no one left to be added to server. Um, and I uh, already have an arrival that's coming up. So I'm done with this row. So I can move on to the next row. And I do that by, again, I just look at the future event list for this row. I look at the first event record. The first event record has a time two in it, which means my next event is going to be at time two. So I will copy everything else down. And now that event is an arrival there is um, an arrival of customer two. The checkout line's empty, so I'm going to put customer two in the checkout line, C2, and I stamp customer two with their arrival time, which happened at clock equal to two. I've added them to the checkout line and no one else is in the checkout line. That means they immediately get service, so I'm gonna add one to the server and leave LQ equal to zero. Because they've just started service, I can schedule their departure. If I look at my next service time, I see that they're going to depart 13 minutes, or 13 seconds, whatever your units are, 13 minutes after the current time. The current time is 2, 13 plus 2 is 15, so I will put D, 15, customer 2. Customer 2 will depart at time 15. Now, um, this was an arrival event. Every arrival event starts the waiting activity for the next arrival event. So I now need to schedule the next arrival event. So let me get rid of that service time since I've already used it. And I look up here, my next into arrival time is three. So I'm gonna say, all right, I look at the clock, three plus two is five. So my next arrival event happens at time five and it will be for customer three, the next customer. So I get rid of the three here because I'm done with that and I make sure my FEL is ordered. It is, good. So this is an arrival, which means I don't touch these cumulative variables because these cumulative variables for this system are only with reference to departures. So I just copy them down. My next event, I look at the previous future event list and it is an arrival at time five, time five. So I'm gonna put this at five and I'm going to copy the rest of that FEL down. It's an arrival. Customer two is in the checkout line, so I'm gonna copy customer two down. 
and I'm going to add customer three to the checkout time. Customer three um, arrived at time five, so she gets stamped with time five. Because she arrived and has to wait, she's now second in the checkout line, so she is our first member of the queue. So I copied the one down, and then I added one to LQ. And now one plus one is equal to the two people standing in the checkout line, where two is getting serviced and three is waiting. Now, this row is an arrival. Arrivals, um, whenever you, you process one arrival, you have to schedule the next. So I look up at my inter-arrival times, and the next inter-arrival time I haven't used is 10. So I'm going to add 10 to 5, and that tells me that my next arrival is going to be at 15 of customer 4. So I get rid of this 10 because I don't need that anymore. I've just used it. This is an arrival event. I don't do anything with these at arrival events, so I'm going to leave them all equal to 1. Okay. So this is interesting, right? Now I have two, um, my FEL has actually got two events at the same time. But um, just to keep things consistent, I'm just going to process the first one first. So I'm going to jump to time equal 15 and process the arrival event. Um, if, I suppose if you wanted to, you could process both events simultaneously. Uh, and, um, and maybe that's uh, what we'll do. That way we don't have two um, entries for time equal 15 all at once. So let's just start with the arrival. So um, I, will, I am going to copy everything else that happens after time equal 15 down. And since this was an arrival, I now need to schedule the next arrival. So I look up and my next inter-arrival time is 7, so I'm going to get rid of the 7. 7 plus 15 is 22, so my arrival of customer 5 will happen at 22. Because it's an arrival, I need to put, I copy, I'll just copy this checkout line down. And then I add customer 4 who arrived at time 15 to the end of this checkout line. And I have to add one more to the queue because we're still waiting on customer two to finish service. And I'm going to leave these things where they were. Now this gets tricky because I need to remember I also need to process this departure event. This is a departure event. So um, I'm going to just basically modify this row to record the impact of a departure on the current state of the system as it is right now. So since it's a departure event, we say who departed, customer two departed, so I can get rid of customer two. Um, customer two um, departed, so I am going to set LS equal to zero right now. And customer uh, two departed, so I'm going to increase the number of departures to, by one. Customer two service time, well, if I look, customer two arrived at two. She left at 15. 15 minus two is, uh, is 13. So um, I need to add 13 to this S here, so that gets me up to 14. And, and 13 is greater than 5, so I need to add 1 to my count of customers who spent 5 minutes or more in the system. All right, so anything else I need to do? Well, I had a departure, and there are customers waiting. So this first customer can finally now enter service. So I'm going to decrease LQ and increase LS representing customer three starting service. Since customer three started service, I can now schedule her departure. Customer three, um, if I look at the next service time, my next service time is four, the current time is 15, so the departure is gonna be 15 plus four, it's gonna happen at 19. So I will have a departure at 19 of customer three. All right, I think I'm done with that row. That one was tricky, I didn't plan for that that I would have two events happening at the same time. 
All right, if that happens to you, I think it would be totally legitimate if you want to have two rows, one a 15 to process the arrival, another 15 to process the departure. I just did it all at once. Um, all right, so this next row is going to be time 19. We're getting close to our end time, um, but we just keep processing. Oh, and look, I made a mistake here. So I need to move this arrival that happened at 22. I need to move it to the end to keep the FEL in order. All right, so I'm gonna jump down to 19 and I'm gonna copy everything from this FEL down. And that was a departure. So since it was a departure, then um, I know that customer three is going to be gone. Customer three just left and I can copy the rest of the checkout line down. It's a departure. So initially, I might leave LQ where it is and decrease LS. And increment, I could say, well, I have one more departure. And then I need to ask, how long was uh, customer three in the system? Well, customer three, oh, I accidentally deleted customer three from the, um, from the head here. right? So customer three was there and I, okay, so now if I look, customer three arrived at five. She departed at 19. So um, 19 minus five is 14. So she spent 14 in the system. That's 28. And that is definitely more than five. So we're going to add her to the number of long departures. Now she departed and there's another customer behind her that now can immediately enter service. And so I'm going to move that customer into service by removing one from the queue and adding one to the server. And because I've moved her into service, I can schedule her departure. If I look at the service times, the next service time is two. So I am going to then schedule a departure two minutes after 19, which is at 21. So I get a departure of customer four at 21. All right, and then that, um, I would keep moving, but I see that my next event is an end event. So that looks like I pretty much am done. So um, just following the books convention, I am going to stop there with this being the last row, and I can go and uh, delete this row here. So I go like up to table, um, I can delete row, and then we get this guy down here. So if I want to add some style here, I might you know, make this bold. Um, I might uh, adjust the, um, the, the width of these cells here. I'm doing this by, um, by kind of double clicking on the, the bars. Um, sometimes if, um, sometimes Word, if you click just right, double click on the, the bar similar to how in Excel, it'll, um, it'll resize it to sort of the the largest element in the column. So I've got this thing, it looks pretty good. All right, now um, I end up not using that service time. That's totally fine. Um, I'm done with my sims, so I'm gonna get rid of those completely now too. Now before this, I actually went and did this on my own, and I um, let's see if I got the same thing. And it looks like it looks like I did here, although looking, uh, I, it looks like I flipped my convention. This is supposed to be D21C4. So, um, and then it looks like I flipped the column ordering as well. So um, this is supposed to be S in D F. So when I did this earlier, if, um, so if I look, do I get all the same clocks? Yep, I do. Do I get all the same LQs? I do. Get all the same LSs? I do. Is my checkout line the same? It is. Is my FEL the same in every row? It looks like it is. Notice this FEL is ordered differently than this FEL because these two events happened at the same time, but that's totally okay um, because there's there's no you know it doesn't it's sort of arbitrary how to order them there, um, but uh, all the others um, seem to match, so that's good. 
Um, and then I, again, I got my, my column ordering flipped when I did this earlier, uh, but um, S, this column down here seems to match this one. This column down here seems to match this one. This column down here seems to match this one. Look at that, they all match. And that's the beauty of this whole process is that given any set of inter-arrival times and any set of service times, then if you follow this simple rule of looking at the previous future event list and using that to guide the construction of the next row, including the next future event list, then you always end up getting basically the same thing out. So um, it's just a bunch of basic steps that are much easier for a computer to do. Just like you saw, I made that mistake where I did DC421. Um, you know, well, a computer wouldn't make that mistake. So, um, right, so that's why we'll eventually have a computer do this instead. But that's basically what you'll do for your homework. Um, I recommend making sure your columns are in the same order as they are on the homework. Um, uh, you know, so I apologize for doing NDS and F. I think on the homework they're actually S, N, D, and F. Uh, so that was just uh, me sort of forgetting when I was doing this experiment, and I don't want to re-record this video, so uh, apologies for that. But yeah, do them in the right order as they are on the homework. Uh, and, um, and that'll make the graders time a lot easier. And I don't think on your homework solution you'll get this funny case where two events happen at the same time. I normally would avoid that, um, if, but I was just sort of making the numbers up as I went, and so that's how it turned out. All right, so I hope that helps. If you have any other um, questions, um, you can try to send some last-minute uh, notes to me or your TAs. Um, no guarantee that uh, you know that uh, that you'll get an answer in say the next you know 24 to 48 hours, but um, you know we'll definitely give it a shot. But hopefully this will help for those of you who couldn't manage to get it to office hours. Uh, so um, yeah.